It's Radar Radio. It's, uh, welcome to the neighborhood. Myself, Chucky Online, Benny Scars. Today, listen, this is a special one <laughs> for me in particularly. Yeah? <laughs> so, Your uncle's in. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say this one time and one time only. Hang on one second. Let me get my phone out to oh, okay. this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, yeah? <laughs> Today we have one sec, one sec, chuck, 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 chuck. See, people just recognise the voice already. He's I got know, a recognisable voice, you know. Distinctive, you know. Bro, this is going to be longer than fifteen seconds, or is. like however long the Instagram one is, ten seconds or fifteen. This is a long one. All right, yeah, it's recorded. All right, cool. So today, right, we have a a guy who is very special to me, someone that I have looked up to for. A very long time, <clears throat> ever since I started my DJ and DJ and radio career. He is a DJ. He is a radio broadcaster, a legend in well, both, can I say? Alive, yeah. Alive. Right? <laughs> a record company executive, a album producer, yeah? A multi do you know how much albums this guy has sold, <laughs> compilation wise? Uh. Yeah. A multi award winning DJ personality, MBE. Well, not I'm to stopping, forget. I'm stopping. I'm, I'm pressing stop. Right. <laughs> not <laughs> not to much. forget. But, you know, somebody who has, you know, been a, a, a real pioneer in the scene. And I think that when you look at radio, for example, there's three people who are a part of our culture that have laid blueprints for for many of us that have come through on radio. One, you would say, is Tim Westwood. The other, you would say, is David Rodigan. Ladies and gentlemen, I want everyone to make some noise for Trevor Nelson! Thank you. Oh, bless, bless the office. Bless the hey. office. Bless the office. You let, let me tell you something. That was the best intro that, that, he's ever he's done. Been, <laughs> I was leave it to working, Ben, really. He's been working on that for he's a while. He's been working on that for about yeah, 20 years. I know. No, I just kind of <laughs> I just kind of just wanted it to just be organic, to be honest with you, because you're someone I've known for a very long yeah, time definitely. you know what i mean and yeah. and um you know i mean every word when i say that when i came into this game you know you were somebody that i looked up to it was a lonely place when i came into this game we were just saying exactly you know what I, I, I just place. said this to chucks and i just said you know that, that was something that we wanted to get into yeah, you know what i mean happy, i'm happy to talk about you know I, thank you first of all chucky and benny i'm, yes. I'm here on your show because you know it's love yeah you know, you're one of the only guys <laughs> I've hired to de DJ at my parties and you've played longer than me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is the only, that is the only, uh, New Year's Eve, when we, when, when I'm throwing a party, I know the, I know the crowd, I know there's only a couple of DJs can yeah. handle my, the mixture of people that yeah, come to yeah, my yeah. gigs and Chucky's one of them. So that's the it's biggest a pleasure. I, mean, I can give him. It's, 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 it feels so good to be able to like, firstly be asked to DJ at your parties anyway. <laughs> they were always good, right? Yeah, always. And yeah. then for you to then just say to me, you know what, Chuck, go on, you go on that. No, I do I'm my like, bit and I just can't wait for the guy to get on. He's great, he's great. So, no, no, I'm here. I'm just, you know what, I, my daughter's on this station as well. Yes. And I love the fact she's doing her own thing. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm in no way responsible for her creativity. She does her own thing That's like I did when I was young. And I admire her sort of drive and mm -hmm. determination to keep it real the way she did. For me, uh, man, we could be here for four hours. We really could. It, it's... I think I'm at the happiest point in my life right now because I'm not trying to prove anything. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, it's that thing. I, I see, I see me in your, you guys all the time. I see the drive you lot have. And I think, yeah, man, I'm, I, you know, we lay the foundation and all these guys are coming through and it's mm -hmm. brilliant, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of obstacles. Of course. There were a lot of, uh, there's lots of stories. Yeah. There's lots of, it's really funny because I saw my first record company boss in here just now no he, way he's Today. got an office upstairs clive clive black has an office <laughs> upstairs he's the first guy to give me a job in the record in, or offer me a job in the record industry amazing really i turned him down okay <laughs> <laughs> he'll tell you the story <laughs> sorry clive but he ended up being my boss yeah. uh, it's really a funny story but he ended up being my boss and he always used to say you know what he used to call me sydney poitier because he always said you're going to be a star okay mm. i don't know why he saw something in me and um yeah, that's just one part of my story. I'm sure that there's loads. And, um, you know, I kind of want to start a little bit at the beginning with you. Because I know that you grew up in, in Hackney. Yeah. Can you give me, you know, I want to find out a little bit about what Hackney was like when you was growing up. And what was going on, even like as a, as a teenager. Yeah, yeah, things yeah. that were going on around Hackney, even it like politically. Rough. It was rough. It was rough. At 15, um, I was... You know, if you walk in the street late at night, you could get thrown into a, a, what we call a, 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 a 
the Black Mariah, I think they were called, like police van. Okay. Innocent as I was a geek, you know, walking with my my sort of sports bag, they they harass you. You know, it was it was hard. Mm. It was hard. And um, growing up, you know, as a black kid, I didn't, you know, I went to my careers guy. He didn't give me no advice at all. Yeah, try and get a job, mate. That was more the, the advice. No mm. one went. I didn't know one person went to university, not one. Mm. And I kid you not, not one. And it was free. Really? Uni was free because we didn't feel that there was, we, we didn't see beyond the end of our road. We didn't see beyond Dalston, mm. you know? And so I got a job in retail. My first job was in the shoe shop. You know, I loved music. I spent every penny on music. I couldn't sort of think I could have a, a, a career in music because I didn't know anyone who had a career in music. Mm. I mean, it was just, there was no career in music. I love radio. I didn't think I could be on it. I just used to listen to it and thought, what a job. That's mm. just the best job in the world. You know, I love music. That's, and um, but it was. What was you listening to? Like you I, say, you love radio. Who was you? Who was you listening there to? There were there were two radio shows on that were legal. Robbie Vincent, Craig Edwards. Craig Edwards was a sort of American guy. Robbie Vincent was English. Um, one on Radio London, one on Capital. Mm. Um, Rodigan playing reggae. Shout out to uh, Rodigan. I'm a soul boy, so I I listened to Rodigan just because mm. everybody else did. But really. I wanted to do my own thing, so sound system was the way. Anyone who's of my age will tell you, if you weren't in a sound system, you weren't breathing. Mm -hmm. You know, every, there was about 20 sound systems in Hackney alone mm. and all going up against each other. Did you start off as a box boy? Nope. I, he wasn't a box boy, I no? Never, I was never a box boy because I started a sound system that was like no other one in Hackney. I wanted to be, I wanted to play alternative music. Hackney was a very reggae, lovers rock right and if you want to play if you want to be different if you want to dress different or anything you had to hide <laughs> you had to, <laughs> we had to change we had to put our clothes in a in a bag in a sports bag go to the club change in the toilets because you couldn't walk down the street the way we used to dress we used oh, to dress right. like yeah in them days it was very tribal I, th I see a lot of you today and i think i can tell you guys that you two are into you know what i mean the music but there's a lot of kind of homogenous is that the word I should use dressing mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. guys are wearing skinny jeans and da 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 and da 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 and you can't tell what their bag is you know yeah. they'll go to a festival and they'll go from one stage to the other to the other to the other and it's all different types of music yeah, yeah. not in my day that's true actually because I think day. somebody else I think my mum actually said this to me like you could always tell what somebody listened to Just by how they were dressed yeah. from a yeah. hundred yards my friend yeah. you know if you're a soul boy you pierce your ear <clears throat> left left side mm. you have a little sleeper you, you wear college shoes loafers you wear drain pipe cotton trousers or dungarees mm. or th there's so many signs that said i'm a soul boy mm. if you're a reggae boy you wear gabichi you wear you have a chaps you have a bit of jewelry you wear skins you wear slacks you wear you know you you wouldn't do there's certain things you wouldn't do with your hair Mm. And it was it was very very like that because you have to understand at the time there was skinheads there was um, rude boys there was new romantics there was everybody was fashion was so powerful mm. because it's not like today where you could you know chucky online do you get what I mean mm. you've got a persona you've got you've got other outlets to show off who you are it was just about the clothes mm. you you got one moment someone takes a look at you that's it there were no camera phones to record stuff you know. That's you. So you're walking down the street and you want the whole world to know. Mm. That is it. I guess also like it was a bit of a badge of like, you've had to go out and source that outfit from wherever you've sourced you. it from. Yeah. Like, you needed yeah. to... I, I, even even as a kid, I remember having to, you know, you're, you're seeing someone with a certain pair of trainers or whatever that it might be, and you you kind of got to ask where they got them from because they're just not everywhere. Yeah, Do you yeah, know yeah. what I mean? And like now, uh, it, it's very easy to find out where everything comes from. So, I've got a picture of, of me that I'm <laughs> going to show you that thankfully your listeners can't see. <laughs> well, right. do you know what? We might take the picture and we might. <laughs> I'm going to show you this picture. I'm going to show you this picture and you're going to understand exactly what I'm talking about. This is me. Let me have a look. When I was about 18, look at what I'm wearing. I've got a leopard skin Is collar. that you at the front? Yeah, I've got right, a leopard Trevor's skin got collar. Hair, you know. That's the first time I've seen Trevor with hair. I'm know? wearing a studded belt. I'm wearing patent slip-on shoes. <laughs> I've got stretch jeans on. You look like a yard man. Boy, <laughs> mate, that's... That, you look I just, like a I just found that, that in my attic. And, I, and, I'm, and that's why I tell you, we come yeah. down the street dressed like that. So, yeah, that was one thing. So the Sandman thing was really important. Um, 
you know, you start a sound system to, 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 to get heard, you couldn't get a gig in most clubs. Yeah. yeah. Forget about it. They wouldn't even let us in clubs in the West End. Just because it's just colour your skin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The story. You're not, you know, you heard, you know the stories. Of course. Right? And they get black bouncers to turn you away. <laughs> that way it was legit. Mm. Wow. So, so it was really like that. But, but you know what? I, w I had the best upbringing. I had the best life. I yeah. had the best... It was a real, I knew every single person who lived on my road. Yeah. Mm. Everybody, you know, so uh, it's not a horror story I'm telling. Yeah. It was a great time. Mm. Things were very simple, you know, and vinyl became my, you know, the record shop was my church. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Which 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 one? Because uh, like there must have been, was there just one record shop at first that you was going to? Yeah. Was there was Mr. Music opposite. Yeah. Mr. Music right now would be Dalston, Dalston Junction. Yeah. Right. I don't know what it's all changed up there, but mm -hmm. it, but right before the traffic lights, just before the traffic lights, Dawson mm -hmm. Junction. That was my shop, Mr. Music. My other shop was GM Records, Low Clapton, mm. off Mayor Street, kind of no, off Mayor Street, off the back of Mayor Street. Yeah. And then you, I would go secondhand record shops all yeah. day, all day, all day, and I every really miss penny. that. Do you know that? Jeff? Yeah. I'm not gonna lie. I really miss that whole era of just going out and just finding music and spending time in a record shop hanging out in a record shop meeting people in a record shop this talking other to music. djs in a record exactly shop. <laughs> all in the world that. to write all of that but you know <coughs> like i think that like that was what that was what made djing in particular very special i didn't know that at the time because yeah. when I, I was just young and yeah. I was just getting music. I was just yeah. buying it. I was spending my, a lot of my money on it. a lot of money, even, yeah, then, exactly. even when you were growing up, right? But the thing about it is that you had to really sacrifice massively yeah. to be a DJ. I think today you get a lot of phony DJs who, and what I mean by that is, I'm not saying they don't love music, but they wouldn't, if someone said, you're going to buy them trousers, or you're going to buy some music, they'll buy the trousers mm. and still DJ mm. off what they had already. You yeah. know, we... we I mean, we lived and died for it, you know what I mean? Because we had to. Mm. So what you what you had, you didn't have as many people trying to do what you're doing. Yeah. See, uh, can I just go off what you just said, though? I do, like, I do think that there's not, like, with certain DJs today, of today, and where the difference is, is that I felt that when I was growing up as a DJ, you had DJs that loved music. Yeah. Now I feel like there's just DJs that just like music. I, I wanna they be, just I, like I, it. It's, yeah, just, but, it's just the... Yeah, but I'm going to be straight with you. I didn't... My my dear old mate Jazzy B once said, "Yeah, I've got in a sound system because that's where the girls were at." Okay, you know now he loves music. He's made music, right? It's funny he says that because I never saw that. Yeah. I never. I assumed every single person <clears throat> that came in the club came to hear tunes, mm. not socialise. That's just a part of it, mm. you know. Not drink, not get drunk. In them days, it, you didn't see people falling around, mm. having to get smashed to have a good time. Because we didn't have what you have here. We didn't have radar. We didn't have all these stations. We didn't have, you know, we didn't have the internet to listen to music. You had to go to a club to hear your music. You couldn't hear it even on radio. So people were at clubs and people were coming up, a queue of people coming up to me saying, what was that you played? What was that? What was that? Because it's the first time they're hearing stuff. Yeah. So their ears were tuned. They, they're going in a club hoping to hear something they didn't know. Whereas mm -hmm. today, a lot of people go in a club hoping to hear a tune they got. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. It's a big it's difference. Yeah, it takes the true. power away from the DJ yeah. so much. You ask, a... So many DJs will say, oh, where's the DJ booth? Can people get to me? Mm -hmm. That's like the first line. Yeah. Can people, oh, but they can't get to me. Brilliant. I might be able to get away with playing something I really want to play and yeah. see if it works rather than people leaning in the booth saying, you got the latest Rihanna, you got the this, you got the that. You yeah. know, they don't trust I'm actually DJ. thinking about getting a t-shirt that says just, <laughs> I, I thought about this already, yeah? Just making a t-shirt that says, like, fuck off and enjoy yourself. Yeah, yeah. So anytime yeah. somebody comes up to me it's, like, oh, can I do that? I just show them my t-shirt, fuck off and it, enjoy yeah, yourself. Yeah, but it's difficult because they're customers. You can't do that. <laughs> you can't do that. I just feel that just spend time on yeah. trying to have a good night it's as opposed diff to just... It's, it's changed, Chuck. It's changed. It's changed forever. Yeah. Mm. It changed a long time ago, not just now. No, of course time. not. Of course. A long time ago. Yeah. There's people growing up thinking, listening to this now, thinking, what are they talking about? <laughs> nah, it's true. The process of music discovery like, is so different. Yeah, it's really different. It's, it's so really different. Cool. And it's very, it's interesting that you bring that up because I can completely relate. It's not, I hadn't even consciously thought about that lately but it's it's real yeah it's yeah. real yeah, like it you is, used to discover is. music in the club but i don't want to i don't want people to, i don't you know there's a lot of people out there going oh it looks like i missed a really nice era and i missed it <laughs> and i missed it but you know when i was growing up 
everyone's chatting about the 70s yeah, yeah. yeah. and the 60s yeah making us feel like the 80s was rubbish yeah and now and then in the 90s everyone's saying oh the 80s man underground warehouse parties and and the 90s is rubbish and then in the mm. noughties everyone's going oh, 90s r&b was the best and da, yeah. da, 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 da. And now we look at us 2017 mm. yeah. and we're reminiscing affectionately oh miss this miss but yeah the opportunity out there right now is better than it's ever been yeah 100%. to do whatever you you can dream and your dream can become a reality whereas i couldn't even dream mm. so i don't i don't you know it's great today in a different way pirate radio yeah did you did you want to pirate radio did you have your first job in music before pirate radio or did it come after pirate radio i had my first job in music just before pirate radio and my first job in music was as an import salesman so my job was to get all the new music from America because literally 95% of everything came from the States. So I'd be on the phone ordering new music, like this real conversations like, you know, hey, we got this guy, we got this new LL Cool J and I'll say, can I hear it? And they'll put, a sp they'll put the telephone to a speaker and distort <laughs> the hell out of it, <laughs> play it down there and, and it's like, mama said knock it or something yeah. like before that even, yeah, yeah. you know, before that to be fair, early LL. His, his early stuff, mm. radio and stuff. And I'm like, um, sounds all right. Can I have 50? No, man, you're going to need like 400. And uh, you know, you've got to take that risk. Pick it up from Heathrow, run around and, and sell them to import shops. So I had that job. Then I was working in a record shop, one of the shops I used to buy my music from. And it was at that point, a guy called Tosca, who Kiss had just started a little while ago, a few months. And there's a guy called Norman Jay on there that I really liked. Mm. And my DJ hero was a guy called Paul Trouble Anderson. Okay. Because I used to go to Electric Ballroom. He used to play there, electro. It was all electro funk and stuff like that. And I said, no hesitation. He heard me DJing in an illegal party in Leytonstone in the flats mm -hmm. in a tower block. Mad. How do you throw a blues party in a Mad. tower block? Disrespectful, man. <laughs> so the sound must have been going up and down. And he heard me and he came in the next day and he said, do you want to be on Kiss FM? Okay. And I said, he said, Was that a big deal at the time? Mm, for me huge there was only kiss to me or lwr yeah to me there were the two stations that really were playing the sort of music i really i mean there were lots of soul stations you know but i i love soul but i don't like back to back to back to back to back to back to back mm. soul all 24 hours you know you got to mix it up so i was glad it was kiss because kiss was the one and you could yeah. sense it there's something special about them something special about the people on them on, on that station already and yeah I was I got the graveyard shift oh yeah at the weekend I turned the station off one till four was my first show in the morning okay we were down Woolworth Road underneath a bookies and I was walking up and down past the, past the door about eight times before I went in because you just scared looking around because in them days they lock you up yeah mm. the detail take your records yeah things like that it was very scary and I open, you know, you get a key, you open the door, you go downstairs. And yeah. mate, I remember my first show like it was yesterday. Mm. Yeah. And I treated it, I probably had 100 people listening. I treated it like, I treated it with more care and attention than any show I do today. Wow. And that was back then. I, I was I was so into it, it was scary. If my show wasn't on, I, I've even quoted this recently, I would nearly cry mm. if yeah. my show wasn't on. Because I would spend all my money on music that week probably a hundred plus yeah. pound or my all dying my to play it dying to play it and the dti take you off here yeah and you're like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> just like what you know Pissed. it was it was like that and it was very exciting yeah. how, very how exciting. common and prominent was the pirate radio culture at that time it was it was rampant yeah it was you know there was good bad and ugly pirate radio stations mm. were, just like they probably still are yeah, you know yeah. like people who are in it for the wrong reasons it's a little hustle for them. People are in it to because they really are earnest, want to break music. And, you know, and just people who, some people sounded like they wanted to be proper legal DJs. We, mm. I used to kind of laugh at them because they sounded so slick. Mm. And I'm like, what do you think you are, man? This is pirate. You know, mm. you know what I mean? It was a bit like, so everybody had their own little agenda on mm. there, but nobody, <clears throat> but nobody knew what was going to happen. No, we just did it as a hobby, kept us out of trouble. Yeah. Was your job in music a hobby though? Like just b prior to you starting on radio? Because that was one thing I wanted to ask you as mm. well. Like what, you're obviously a young guy, you're buying yeah. music, you love music. Yeah. You know, 
at what point was it like because you know as you mentioned before it's a lonely place there's you, there's not much people that you could look up to and say okay yeah this person they're carving a a, a blueprint in uh, moving into the music industry or being a yeah. a, a, a radio dj where did you take point? did i just take yeah. it seriously and figure yeah. it do you know what it's funny um the record shop thing no it's not serious it's just a means yeah, here mum is a bit of rent you know mm. yeah, it's a job but it's in something i knew Mm. music I loved it so but I couldn't look beyond six months working in a record shop you know you don't want to be in there your whole life do you so but I didn't I didn't think where am I going to be it, it wasn't reality the first time I actually felt a member of the music industry was when we got a license mm. up until then to me it was just a game I started doing my own gigs I was I was promoting my own gigs you know, I, always, I, I was never scared, and this is what I find a lot of people are. They're scared to put their name on a flyer on their own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and this might be even you guys, I don't know if it's hit you. No. Right? You put your name on your flyer, you go out and you promote your own night. Mm -hmm. If 10 people turn up, so be it. If you always wait for the phone to ring mm -hmm. and be booked on a big DJ lineup, you're at the hands, you're at the mercy of others. So I, 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 went, I, I remember my first gig, 30 people turned up. Mm. 27 were on the guest list. Wow. The club held 500 people. <laughs> but we've been there. Yeah. Together uh, exactly. and individually. I have, been there. I, have one, I have one night in there and then I got thrown out. Yeah. I looked at my mate who was DJing me and he said, I'd never forget. He, he looked at me and he said, this shit ain't working, bro. Yeah. <laughs> you know <what> I, mean? <laughs> I looked at him and I said, look at the positive. Three people paid to get in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to grow. No, but my list. attitude was, honestly, I am going to grow those three people. Yeah. And that's exactly what I did. I didn't stop. It didn't stop me. I kept putting that, that you go to get a club night. You ain't going to get a Friday night. You ain't going to get a Saturday night. They're going to give you a Monday night. Mm. The hardest night of the week or a Tuesday night. And in them days, you had to hire the club, pay the bouncers. I mean, it was it was a lost leader all the yeah, way. Yeah. We must have been mad. Mm. Yeah. But I'm glad I was like that because mm. while all my friends were getting into house music, started earning money, mm. doing other things, I just stuck with my little 150 capacity venues, mm. yeah. 200 capacity venues, because no matter what anyone says, R&B is best enjoyed in intimate clubs. Intimate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, we do the odd, you know, massive gig mm. and it becomes a struggle because yeah. you can't get that, that vibe you know, mm. when you've got too many people. Mm -hmm. But and that was me so that was me you know i just had yeah. to i i was on my own mentally yeah constant and you'll find this from norman me jazzy even giles peterson you're kind of on your own mm -hmm. you, you know there were 30 djs on kiss why only a few of us made it to that level because we were very we could see stuff you know what i mean yeah. we could see what we were going to do next it's not the same mm. we would have got really big it's about survival isn't it it's about yeah. i want to do that night next week i want that yeah. night to just keep going it's hard yeah, yeah. Mm. It's, it's harder now because young people got so many options yeah, yeah. you know in our day if you got the right people you got loyalty you could go a long long way you know let me ask you a question because in my for me personally like out of all of the things that i've done Putting on a night is one of the most nerve-wracking oh, things, things in the world, and, str and it, it, I feel like genuinely, you know, when someone's, oh, I feel sick. It you really do. brings out and your I'm anxiety. Not, I'm not a it? person like that. We, mm. In most scenarios, I'm like, yeah, like it yeah. will be cool, even if I'm a bit nervous, I'm all right. But putting on a it night is. is one of the most nerve-wracking things. Totally, I literally, I totally agree with you. You feel sick, um, you know, especially when you're not selling tickets and it's just a walk up to the door yeah. scenario, mm, like yeah. it used to be. If it rains, if it, you know, you forked out money, you're putting your, your ass on the line. Yeah. Mm. And then on top of it, you get a crowd and then you don't want any trouble. Yeah. Mm. And, you, you know, I always think the key to being a good promoter and people forget I'm a promoter mm -hmm. as much as a DJ, in a sense. I promote mm -hmm. so many of my own nights. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, you know, I didn't wait for the wrong that I always put myself in the middle of the dance floor. Yeah. Mm. I always looked, I looked at it from their perspective, mm. not mine. Mm. You'll ne he'll tell you he's been to enough of my gigs. I I don't get gassed. Mm. I'm 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 what looking, I'm looking, I'm looking all the time. What crowd of it? Because the crowd make the rave. It ain't yeah. the mm. DJs get too carried away, mm. thinking it's all about me. Mm. It's all about me. It's not. It's the crowd mm. that make the party. If you get a good crowd together, tell me something, man. When we've done some New Year's Eve parties, Chucky, you just before you even put a, a tune on, you're looking at it, you're going, yeah, mate, this is gonna be fun. Yes. Mm. 
Hundred percent. This is not work. Hundred percent. Am I getting paid for this? You know what <laughs> I mean? It's, it, that's what it's like when you get the right crowd. And so, but when you don't, the feeling of illness and sickness yeah, is oh. crazy. It's, it's horrible. Yeah. You wonder why am I doing this again? Mm. Yeah. I've had nights. It feels when, it feels amazing when it works though. But when it doesn't. Yeah, when it doesn't. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's just you just feel like giving up. Yes, yeah, it's disheartening. You think that no one loves you. You yeah. take it very personally. Mm. All these people said they're coming. Your yeah. guest list is ram, and only three people turn up on it. Yeah, it just you, you just think, what's this about? You start yeah. getting phone calls and text messages like, you know what, Chuck's like, I was gonna come today, yeah, you, but yeah, you know rubbish. what, <laughs> my girl came round and my girl yeah, said, yeah, 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 yeah. No, rubbish. exactly. They're watching Game of Thrones, man. Yeah, exactly. You know, they're really, they and that's the thing. Mm. You're up against all of that nowadays. Mm. Yeah, you know. I, I deal with old school parties now because I have a lot of um, people that have come to my gigs in the past that mm. don't go out that much and they want to, they need to trust you. You know, yeah. they need to, they're getting dressed up, they're getting babysitters. Yeah. There's a big commitment now to go out. Yeah. They're parking, it's they're true. doing this. True. They need to trust you a hundred percent. And and I think a lot of people miss the point of people like safety. They like they like that feeling. Mm -hmm. When you're young, you like the buzz of you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. I used to see when there was fights kicking off, people used to run towards the fight and yeah. some used to run the opposite way. Mm -hmm. You know, I ain't mentioning my son. Because <laughs> he, he like, where's the excitement? Yeah. You know, he's What's off. And, and, and that's how you are when you're young. Yeah. When you get a little older, you're just a little bit, you know what? Yeah. I'll come out for this rubbish. Yeah. yeah, yeah I'll come yeah, out to see this again. You, they're not coming again. And that's why I'll tell you something. That, sorry, I'm the chatting. I'm no, that's cool. My dream was to own a club. Oh, yeah? All my life. All my life, own a club, own a bar, mm. program the music, have the same sick pressure you're talking about, yeah. Benny, about are people going to come? Yeah. Have put myself under that pressure. Mm. But you know what stopped me doing it? One incident could happen. It's true. Yeah. It's what, true. Just one it's incident true. and you're all over your whole investment. Your whole investment's, your whole investment's gone. gone. And it conti I see it continually happening yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. where people yeah. just, just yeah. shit on your doorstep, basically. And it usually happens when you have an event that is nice yeah and it's a vibe yeah that's then all I'm of saying. a sudden then people start do you know what i wanted to take one what i wanted to mention as well yeah is that there was another thing that i actually took from you coming up um that a lot of people didn't understand when i was doing it but i always liked how you marketed yourself mm. yeah and when i first started doing parties i thought you know what i'm gonna put my face on a flyer yeah. <laughs> and i'm gonna put my name it's a big, moment. big yeah it's on a big the flyer moment. and it's like a big moment Coming up, a lot of people, when I first yeah. did that, a lot of people was like, right, like, look at my, look at him. Like, who do you, who do you, who do you think you are? This, think he, you'd yeah. see like, you'd see like Chris Brown and Cassie and then yeah. you'd see Chucky. <laughs> Chucky would be in the middle. Yeah, it's true. No, but, no, but do you know what? Do you know, you know what? what? It works though. It's true. And, I, and I, I'm going to give you a little story. When I joined Radio 1, I'd never had my face on any fly in my life, right? I joined Radio 1 and a guy called Diggs, Scott Digg, DJ Diggs, he used to be on one extra years ago. Um, he was one of the DJs I used to mail records to when I was at the record company. And he said, come and do a gig in in in, in Bristol. It's kicking off in Bristol. It's great in Bristol. Come mm. down to Bristol. And I said, oh, okay. And I hadn't done any gigs outside of London. Right? When, I, when I joined Radio 1, I said, no, I'm not doing any gigs outside of London until I get an audience, you know, until I think I'm all right. Mm. So he was the first. And I went down to Bristol. I drove down there. And it was a club called Odyssey. Held about... 1500 people and I came out of my car I and mean, this is a true story there's a big queue down the road I remember the tune at the moment was Fuji's mm -hmm. killing me softly because that was I wanted to play that I wanted to see how that went down and I came out I started walking across the road and I saw this big poster with my face on it and I ran back in my car I was so <laughs> embarrassed I was so embarrassed I thought what are you doing yeah yeah because yeah, I'd yeah. never seen that before you know yeah, me, yeah. Me, you know for me I was just a name yeah what are you doing and I just sat in the car like that on the phone. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> I can't, I can't yeah, you got a back entrance because I feel stupid. <laughs> so anyway, I got in there, club was ram, it was um, amazing. And I, and I realised he marketed me. Yeah. You know, most people didn't even know what I looked like because mm. I was on radio. But he marketed me and I got over it and I thought, actually, this is what you got to do. Yeah. yeah this yeah. is what, we're, we're not like, the Americans will walk around with their face on their t-shirt. Of course. Of course. On the back yeah. of a jacket. Of course. Yeah. We're so like, and I'm seeing We're that. not like that. We're British. We're like, we're like, we're like understated. Yeah, very it's reserved. True. It's true. It's very yeah, reserved. Very reserved. So you've got, to, you've got to market yourself and all this brand, you know, you being a brand, you two being a brand and all this, we didn't know what mm -hmm. that was. We would, that was, 
our survival thing. So mm. all of a sudden, I did MTV and I started putting my face about. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it, and it, and it. I'm not saying it worked. It's just part of the game. I think. Oh, it, I did, think it, it did. did. It did. Work. I think it did, and yeah. I think that I think that it made people. You know, like with when you listen to somebody on the radio, mm. especially when you're listening to them consistently, you feel like you know them, and then when you have that put the face to the name yeah. it makes you it gives you that familiar that familiarity yeah. even more yeah. and I think that that helps as a brand yeah. you know yeah. because people be, yeah. it goes back to what you said before people then start to really trust you they look at the flyer they see your face on it they see your name on it they listen to you on the radio mm. yeah I'm going to that event but there's mm. a lot of qu- man, there's a lot of quality control it's yeah. very difficult I, I would say for any artists out there and you know about all artists we are well known <laughs> for um, artists and stuff um there's a lot of mistakes that get made and you don't always get second chances mm. when you're a certain colour. Mm. You know what I mean? You got you, And I was always aware of that. And, you know, when you're the first guy doing certain things, do you know how heavy that is? That weighs on you. Yeah. That is, that is like, quite, I went home a lot of times and I didn't listen to any of my mates. Yeah. And I just had to sit down. Right, what's tomorrow? What's the strategy tomorrow? Because, yeah. you know, you you just can't do that yeah, or yeah, you can't yeah. do this or you've got to say no to a lot of stuff mm. you know and and I think that I, I was uh, people used to write to me on MTV and say things like are you gay? oh yeah? yeah stuff like that on mm. emails I was like no I didn't, I didn't answer them because cause I wasn't like too macho enough mm. I wasn't like you know what I mean wearing throwbacks and you know mm, being mm, real mm. I was being quite quite straight and I was broadcasting in a way I was on telly being yeah. quite neutral yeah. Yeah. yeah you know what I mean I wasn't being colloquial mm-hmm, dropping mm-hmm, a lot mm-hmm. of slang and stuff like that I did it for a reason because I wanted everyone who's watching to ha- to feel that they were welcome yeah mm. you know into our music and mm-hmm. you know and that wasn't the case before that a lot of people were like just being themselves it was fine mm-hmm. But it made people a bit nervous about coming to an R&B party or a hip-hop rave mm-hmm. or something. Mm-hmm. And I thought, come on, I know who's buying this music and mm-hmm. it ain't all us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They should, everyone should get a sample of this. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, there's a lot. There's a lot that goes with it. I was going to say, like, you know what? Two things I was going to say. One thing, funny story. Mm. I turned you away from a club. No, no, no. <laughs> you didn't turn me away from a club. I mean, you might have turned me away from a club. Nah, nah, nah. nah, but do you know what? It's like, it's funny so. sitting here today, 2017, uh. and thinking like, wow, me and this guy were mm. helping promote your raves and you didn't even know about it Shout in like to Hanif. 2004 yeah, Hanif. 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 You lot was out there late Just for the night. record, Hanif is a dear friend yeah. of, big up Hanif, man. Yeah. of all of ours. Street team. Yeah. Street team. But yeah. you know what? It felt, it's so funny because, because of the marketing that yeah. you had done and yeah. the brand that you had built, it was like it was a thing to be like yeah like be we're helping with it all. Yeah. to promote Trevor's night mm. but it's the same like, as yeah but be honest you were young mm. really young mm-hmm. and it's something to latch on to and you know it? what was more important for me honestly yeah. than money yeah. was like to be associated with things that felt official 100% it was like me and Soul honestly. to Soul it's like when I started with Soul yeah. to Soul Soul to Soul was the most organised sound system I ever saw in my life mm-hmm. right when Jazzy said he tried all these DJs at Africa Center and he said I want you down every week Mm-hmm. You'll be the only non soul to soul DJ mm-hmm. DJ at Africa Center. Man, I wet my pants, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, yeah, cool, cool, cool. But really, I was like, oh my God. You know, it but wasn't about money because I didn't get paid. This a lot. is what I'm saying. It's about, so, and mm. the same goes with H. Well, mm. I, when I met Hanif, a lot of people know who Hanif is. He was a DJ. He's basically a big time promoter now. He's killing the, the college you know bits. the uni mm-hmm. scene and he's doing he's doing lots different, of stuff different, he's, he's, different. he was in a record shop mm. and I saw really good in him mm. you know what I mean and, and everybody associated to us we find that the, you know down the line he's got Martin he's got you, you, you yeah. and everyone is a good person mm. yeah. do you know what Martin I mean that's Christmas. how we do it that's how we don't we don't you know we don't run some big organisation he runs his own thing I do my own thing mm-hmm. yeah. we're not like that yeah. but I, I found him, I saw good in him. Mm. He finds people good in them. Yeah. And it just goes down. And then we all, everyone seems to end up doing something. Mm. No doubt. And it's like, you trust me, if you act like an idiot in this business, it comes back. Yeah. It comes back. The same guy, you see, I didn't know you were doing that. Yeah. I yeah. genuinely didn't. Yeah. You could be sitting there hating me no, because nah. I might have said, no, but you get what I mean? That oh, was, yeah. That I, get, was, I get the sentiment of what you're yeah, saying. But yeah. that was one of the first opportunities. How many people trod on my flyers then? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? You know what? To this day, to this day, uh, it, I, I, you know, I'm frequently walking in the West End or whatever. People are flyering. 
right still i have empathy mm. for them yeah, yeah i course. take the flyer yeah even if i'm going to put it in the next bin i just take it because you know what yeah. i know what i've handed out it. if i had a pound for every flyer oh my i've God. taken flyers <laughs> off people just fly into shops and i take yeah, it. yeah. i do i do because yeah. i understand yeah. the, i understand the it's hustle, a grind it? man it's a grind i used to listen i used to do gigs come out at four o'clock and then go to clubs mm. yeah for 10 people coming out yeah mm. I drive half an hour for the ten mm. people. Just give it. It's just what you do. Listen, I've driven to. I remember one time I drove to Leicester mm. to just give out some flyers for something or the other, mm. and it was cold. It was raining. I've done it in the snow. Mm-hmm. Like that was a real commitment. Yeah. yeah. I just want to just go back to the radio thing very yeah. quickly, yeah. You because you was on Kiss One Hundred from when it was illegal. Yeah. To then turning legal. Yeah. Did your style? Style, did you did your style stylistically change in terms of how you was presenting music? So, for example, was you going? Was that the moment when you went from being a radio DJ to more of a presenter? Yeah, I still wasn't very good at first. I, I'm going to be honest. If you listen to me on Pirate, I was terrible. I sounded like I didn't want to be there. But you can be. The music Pirate. was great. The music was great. Yeah. But we were all trying to be too cool, so we sounded like it was bored, fed up, you know. But that was, you mm. know, that's how we sounded. I think legal radio was a shock to most of us mm. because you have to understand we're talking about Pat Sharp. You wouldn't know who Pat Sharp is. No, Mick Brown. I know Pat Sharp. Okay, Pat Sharp, Mick <laughs> Brown generation. Yeah. Slick, real bit, you know, <laughs> you know, everything's fantastic, <laughs> fabulous. Yeah, let's go. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And we come from, we, we had this little army of supporters who were used to us being quite real, a bit like Radar, you know, quite mm. real, you mm. know, and all of a sudden we're on this commercial beast and we needed to get so many listeners and we needed to do and it i they gave me a daytime show and i was kind of loving it for a while because i got a chance to play the first mary j the first massive yeah. attack all these sort of firsts yeah but i don't think i really got to grips with what commercial radio is about you know we didn't really know and i think the biggest mistake kiss made was keeping all their djs from pirate onto legal yeah you had to be brutal really half of us should have gone yeah you know straight away and uh, we're on the back foot straight away but i it took me till probably i got to radio one mm. to really not to not hold anything to be more me even when yeah. i was on radio one to be honest still wasn't me yeah because the I'm, lick I'm, was I'm, me the really lick the lick was me the lick was the, the lick first was you. time oh, yeah. mm. you got really me i felt so comfortable yeah you know like i was like no one's gonna watch me if i'm looking shy but at the same time, I don't want to look too big, like, like full of myself. But at the same time, you, no one's going to watch. If you go, you pay money to see an entertainer on stage and he comes up there looking a bit shy, you want your money back. Mm. 100%. Same way, I don't want someone over getting gassed over the top, mentioning their name five million times when they're DJing. Because mm. to me, that's just counterproductive as yeah. well, right? So you've got to get a balance. Mm. And it was, I think Radio 1, about a year in, I was relaxed. I didn't enjoy the first year. I was really nervous too nervous but MTV I just took to it mm. I just I think MTV you know you just find I thought wow this is yeah. you, know, they, they, you know they're letting us do our own thing yeah yeah, yeah. you could sense it you could see we, we were doing what we wanted yeah and it was really it was really like free yeah. I loved it so talk to us a little bit about that actually because yeah. you know the lick was a thing like especially for me growing up yeah you know, um mtv bass mtv at the time huge music station yeah there was no bass at first there There was was no no bass bass. no it was just mtv at first talk to me a little bit about um how you transitioned into going into the tv stuff and how even mtv bass came about well we (laughs) mtv was rubbish right I I, i thought it was rubbish as a station it was all built as a youth generation mtv generation i thought i used to put it on and they had yo mtv raps you remember that yeah of course right and that was once 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 a week from america hour long and they had some <laughs> show called a more with a girl who's italian lying on a thing being very cheesy playing luther van dross and stuff at the odd and i'm like where is our music mm. this is the music channel so believe it or not there was an interview someone said go for an interview at mtv they're looking for a presenter for the other i couldn't do the job i was on I was working with Clive upstairs. I was working full time for him. What and label were you at? EMI. Okay. And um, I was also doing my gig. I couldn't. I couldn't do the job. But I went to see them because all I wanted to do was tell them how rubbish they were. <laughs> so I sat there, and the guy's filming an interview with me. Right? He's going, "Yeah, okay, screen test." And I said, "Why aren't you playing black videos? 
Why aren't you playing Buster? Why are we watching the box? Remember you used to watch yeah, the box? Yeah, yeah, box. of course. Yeah, why are we having to pay to play? Why, why? You're, you're the... He said, don't you want it? I said, blah, blah, blah. I was giving it all the revolutionary stuff because I knew I couldn't take the show. So I didn't get the show. That was when Richard got the show, actually. Black I room. think Richard got hired, okay. right? So Richard done his thing. And then a couple of years later, or a year later, they, they, I, I got another call. They didn't know it was me. It was someone else who got me, got me in there. And I said, we really need a show. They really need a show. I said, I'm not a model. I don't look like Maxwell. I know you just want a model. <laughs> it doesn't know nothing about music. I want to talk about music. I don't want to do this. You know, I gave it all that. Mm. They said, you got it. I said, what? I said, yeah, you got the show. I said, well, when do I start? February. Who's going to teach me how to do telly? No one. <laughs> I said, I've never done telly. What do I do? So I just got, my mind started whirring. And I just thought straight away, say something now that you mean. And they'll, I said, I'm not standing up. I'm sitting down. Okay. Because everyone was standing up, remember? Yeah. Everyone used to stand up and, and do stupidness and, and just go throw around, to a video. And, yeah. yeah. I said, I'm sitting down. And then we started filming. And I looked at the first show. I hated it. I hated myself looking at yourself on telly. Mm. So I said, um, let the camera come off me and I'll keep talking. So yeah. remember the moves, yeah, the, yeah, we did yeah, all these moves, that. right? Because yeah. I'm a radio guy, so they can just listen to me talking. Mm. And I said, can we get news from MTV in America? Can we get American news? Because we, we never heard the stories that were going on. You had to buy a magazine. Mm. And it was like four weeks late, or everyone was buying Vibe for mm. the stories. I said, can we get MTV news, hip hop news, as it happened? Yeah. yeah. So what do you do with it? They said, we don't do nothing unless it's big news. The lick was born, basically, because mm. it meant we had all the ingredients we needed. And um, all we needed to do was how are we going to, how are people going to know we're on? Mm. So we're going to advertise it on the channel. I said, but none of my people are watching your channel. Mm. Yeah. So how are we going to, it's going to take ages before they will get to know. So I'll come up with the promoter background. Let's do parties. Because mm. we print loads of flyers. People will print the show times on the flyers stick my face on it mm -hmm. a lot of people collect flyers they don't go to clubs they just True. collect flyers yeah yeah and you'd only know that if you're a flyer True. if you've been flying True. as you know some people will take a flyer you'll never see them at a race True. if they like the artwork they keep it if you would have seen my bedroom at like that's what i'm 15, saying 16 exactly of raves i've never been to <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly but that was the culture people wanted to they were aspiring to rave and mm. you know in the house scene i knew that was happening a lot because mm. i had mix mag dj mag all these kids are lying i saw oki i saw tall paul i saw digweed mm. i did it it's all lies you know what i mean mm. but on our scene we had none of that we had no aspirational nights we didn't really have mm. you know so i said to rachel b who runs i love life she was my me and her were doing club nights and i said to rachel i need a club that none of our crowd can get into that none of our crowd go to and there was some bougie club up in um, Kingley Street or mm. King, King, Emporium, it was called. Yeah, okay. yeah. That all footballers used to go or mm. Arabs or, you know, people with money. And we got a night in there because the MTV brand got yeah. us in there, right? So we got a night in there. You've never seen a queue like it, man. Going all the way down Regent Street. I've never Amazing. seen black people queue so orderly, <laughs> right? I turned up at 10 o'clock. There were people queuing in single file. You never see that. Yeah. Mm. We yeah. had about three bouncers at the door. Yeah. And I was like, wow. That was the first gig. Yeah. We, tur we, we turned everyone away and we'd like, this is going to work. Yeah. Mm. This is going to happen. And we showed the show in the club and it was, that was it. And it was all to do with that promoter background. Yeah. It wasn't them. They, weren't, they were going, you should work in marketing. I'm thinking, mm -hmm. I know a lot of brothers who work in marketing. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you gave us a chance, yeah, you'd yeah. see some real marketing. On that point, Trevor, like, and you know, you just mentioned... Um, working for Clive and the yeah. EMI scenario and you know going into the different corporations whether it the mm. BBC yeah. whether it was EMI uh, whether it was MTV how how was it at that time as a black man promoting black music like, I was like, suspicious I was suspicious Clive Clive should be in there right now because he could tell you about the, the interview he, uh, the interview me and Clive had will go down in my head <laughs> and will only ever come out in a book <laughs> it was legendary I can tell you Seriously, yeah, I can. I remember it like it was yesterday. Mm. You know, he, in fairness to him, he called me out the blue. Jane, who I just saw for the first time in years, she phoned me. I just literally saw the woman just there. Mm -hmm. I got all emotional seeing mm -hmm. her because she phoned me. I was going for a really hard time at home. I was. It was terrible at home actually. I was. Everything was just terrible. Yeah, you know what I mean. And I, I basically had no money. I was in a bad relationship it was just all bad right? yeah yeah and i was very suspicious of the music industry got a call from jane clive would like to see you 
and I'm like, Clive who? Clive Black. He said, the uh, head of A&I at EMI. Mm. I'm like, EMI, that's the Beatles shit. Mm. <laughs> what? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, what does he want with me? <laughs> he just wants to talk to you, you know, no, no, that sort of thing. Uh, I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but I went up. I eventually, she talked me into going. I went up there and I went to this place where the Beatles memorabilia was up. There was discs everywhere, all these EMI, Kate Bush, you know, all these successful artists. I'm like, I'm stepping into the Devilville. Yeah. You know what I mean? This is, this is the, you know. Yeah. But at the same time, I was very impressed by him, to be fair. But um, I, I was too suspicious of the business and I didn't really want to know. Mm. You know, even though he was offering me a great position and um, I just didn't think I was ready mentally or, you know, and I was. The problem was, looking back now, I really was. Mm. He did the right thing. He had the right guy. Yeah. He really did. And, um, but I just wasn't ready mm. and I just went home. Was the business suspicious of you though? Like no. as a black man? No, no, because I was on KISS and I was doing good things mm. on KISS FM and a lot of people were i mean the crux of my interview with clive was i i was all over jamiroquai before he got signed i was all over certain artists yeah. before they got signed yeah and they went on to do really great things and i didn't realize in a sense i was doing a and r already mm. but i didn't know what a and r was mm. do you see what i mean i was naive yeah yeah and in the end i ended up working with clive okay but through a completely weird way it's a long protracted thing but a lot of labels heard i went for that interview and they all started phoning me mm. and asking me if i wanted a job yeah so I, I i was lucky that people said there's a guy clearly who's got something to offer people talk to you but yeah but yeah. i didn't know that I, I i wasn't that that kind of way of thinking yeah. i wasn't really bigging up my chest or anything but and so um the industry was interesting at the time a lot of i will call them urban labels were being set up by the majors everyone had their specialist dance label and a few had a specialist black label because of the amount of material coming out of america mm. the hip-hop the r&b coming out they wanted to release it in the uk and they needed their own imprint to put it on but it was all sexy yeah but it was still the major label stuff you know what i mean that's how it was working and so they started hiring mickey d was a was hired by clive actually and then went to warner's and there were other friends of, sorry friends of mine that were dotted about so it's mm. early early doors really early doors but i i don't like pressure when it comes to music, I, you know, I don't like, I think it's really hard to do a job where you have to have a hit. Yeah. Mm. You know, because there's that divide between what's a good record and what's a hit. Of course. It's not always yeah. the same thing. Yeah. No. It's not always the same thing. A lot of the times, a lot of the records that I love are not hits. Of course. But then, isn't it brilliant if you get a good record that you love that becomes a hit? Yes. Yeah. That's the dream scenario. Definitely. It's very rare though. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I, I did it for five years. It was a turbulent time. And the only reason I left the music industry was because I got the MTV gig yeah. and unlike everybody else I know who would have gone what I'm MTV I'm Radio 1 I'm doing A&R yeah. I can play my own tunes <laughs> I did the here he is he's okay, come, come, here he comes Clive's, <laughs> Clive's got he's probably been listening I heard someone's dishing <laughs> <you now. laughs> get it, that man a mic I was not get dissing you mate I, oh, it was I far get him far on mic. this get on mic mate get, get on, on mic, mic. Right yes Clive good to see you all right. yes, so, Clive. So, yes Clive as I was saying to Clive right as I was saying about how Clive how you doing Clive you alright never better <laughs> get his mic up the there you go get his mic up so Clive can you remember our first well first of all Jane's out there I can't I'm not going to tell you the the year she called me I've said it, I will. It was 1993. Okay. Jane phoned me. I was at home, pretty depressed in a really bad way, right? Yeah. Hating the business. Come and meet Clive, right? And I said, who's Clive who? Clive Black. Like, I should know who he is. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know who he is. <laughs> he's had about, he's had about, had about an A&R, an an right? EMI, something like that? Probably. Yeah, you were. <laughs> <laughs> so I go to Manchester Square. They've knocked it down now. Yeah, they have. Famous... Yeah famously in my building I'm going up there I go into this office and the first thing he says to me where are you from I said Hackney he said I'm from Hackney that's right. right just to prove to you yeah 25 24 years ago I remember exactly what he said he said I'm from Hackney I said shut up and then we realized we we're about the same age and then I think correct me if I'm wrong he then said my dad wrote either Ben or Ben for Michael Jackson or, or or born free or something? Both. Right? Wow. <laughs> and then he said, and we moved to Knightsbridge. Am I right or wrong? Yeah, we got out of the ghetto. Everywhere. <laughs> Give me a round of applause for remembering that 24 yeah, yeah, yeah. years later. Come on. 
I like that. That, that shows to show how it's big true. a meeting that was for Mad. me. Clive, what was it like meeting Clive? Do you remember meeting him as a young man? Yeah, he was the first black man I ever met. <laughs> <laughs> Talking absolute rubbish. So what oh, I'm sorry, Michael Jackson and uh, then, then Oh, I haven't yeah. finished. He said, <laughs> yeah, as a kid, I was play, I, I played with Michael Jackson. Yeah. Sounds funny, funny, but it was, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I know what you what mean. Did, what was that? Tell me, please. Yeah, that sounds... What did you make of me in that meeting? Because I, I remember... Well, you turned it down. That's yeah, what I, I remember. Turned, yeah, I did. That was the funny thing. I thought the meeting went so well. Yeah. And then he turned it down. But yeah, you were nervous, weren't you? you yeah. Were, on a serious level, did EMI... You sense that? Did EMI, you sense that from him? Yeah, because EMI at the time when I went there, it was... The joke was the difference... What's the difference between EMI and the Titanic? And the punchline was the Titanic had one good dance act. Okay. <laughs> and so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. And EMI had no dance music and it had no black music. It was known as a beer drinking rock label. Yeah. Iron Maiden, Pink Floyd. I think Trevor mentioned Kate Bush and stuff. Yeah. So when I was there, I brought in the Positiva lot and we set up the dance label. And I was desperate to get into the urban thing. I think I'd signed Eternal. Yeah, or I can tell you exactly what happened. Eternal? Oh I can gosh. tell you exactly what happened. He'll remember this now when I tell him. This is how big a meeting that was for me, right, Clive? Just so you know. I've right? heard this from everyone, but carry on. No, this is a big meeting, right? So yeah. I've gone in there and he goes, I goes, what do, you, what do you want from me? I'm like, what do you want from me? He goes, well, first of all, he says, what do you think of this? You played me Luchi Lu and Meet You One. And I went, if you don't even know this group, but I went, no, all right. And then he played me Eternal Stay. Yeah. Okay. And I think I might have said to him, that's a Glenn Jones cover or something like that. Yeah. And it's, I said, yeah, but, you know, it's a girl band. Are you going to get this black music? Are you going to get behind it? He goes, we're definitely getting behind this. I said, yeah. well, then it's got a chance because no one gets behind this stuff. That's the problem, right? True. And he said, and then he turned around. I said, so I said, what do you want from me? And he goes, I want to know why no one in this building had heard of Jamiroquai. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. why no? And I, I laughed. I went, I've been playing him before he got signed. I played him yeah. off cassette. Rah, rah, rah. Yeah, he yeah. said, exactly. No one in this building knew. And I think at one point I got up, mm. went to the door. I don't know. You can correct me. And I said, who am I going to work with? There's no black people here. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. think I said that to you. You did, yeah. And you went, you're just going to work with my staff. Mm. And I went, nah. Yeah. <laughs> or something like that it's true it was it was very very white time as you know um, it was so it, uncomfortable for me yeah yeah it was very uncomfortable I, I felt very very i felt I, f I liked him yeah but i just felt i'm gonna come in there shoot my load yeah blow up and go yeah he, he did do that but that's another story <laughs> we'll save that one <laughs> that's a proper story that one but we had a good oh, wow. time I wish, I wish things were different because I yeah. think him and I would have been fantastic. In yeah. better, you know, him and I were having a really tough time mm. in the end, weren't they? And we they never, were. we never really had the chance with other people. And I, and there were a few execs that they, I really rated, and he was one of them. So oh, bless yeah. you. There was Lincoln Elias, if yeah. you remember, at the time at Sony, who it. just signed Terence Trent Darby and okay. Charlotte, Desiree. Desiree. So he there was, was one A and R man who was was into I actually got there was an article about me I think it was in the NME that said the only thing black about Clive Black is his name okay so I thought it was kind of time I brought someone in yeah, okay but, um, but Trevor was marvellous and, uh, and special as he is yeah, today yeah but I didn't I didn't become a success I'm going to make this clear in the record industry yeah in the bed that is his side mm. i didn't i signed lyndon david hall lovely guy oh, wonderful, okay. what wonderful guy I, it was yeah, really funny though it, he this guy left me some pearls so i'm like it's clive okay got this kid lyndon david hall he's written like 50 summit songs and he's clive's like is he a star what a talent he loves stars this guy I do right? love stars, he's like yeah. is he a star I yeah. Said, yeah, he's talent i know but is he a star so he said well just let him showcase so he did a showcase, and Lyndon was really shy. Yeah. Really shy guy. So Lyndon's there, looking sheepish shy. We've got, oh, I'm thinking, Lyndon, stand up right. <laughs> you know, look like a star, because mm. Clive's there. <laughs> and Clive's like, mm, not that impressed. He plays one song, plays another song, not that impressed. And then all of a sudden he put a guitar around his neck and played a song, and Clive went, yeah. This is the guy. Because mm. when he had the guitar as yeah, a crutch, some artists are like that. Yeah. yeah. You imagine Ed without a guitar, mm. Ed Sheeran yeah. without a guitar. I don't know. Yeah, it's yeah. true. You're looking at him, you're like, 
it insane. definitely adds it but adds when you've got that it. crutch yeah. of the guitar mm. yeah. and he went we'll sign him yeah and that was that that made my life I he, loved he it. died way too young that yeah way he died, too he died young. Way young. Young. we got one gold album out of him and we could have got a lot more out yeah. i remember his manager was a black belt sixth dan in taekwondo <laughs> he had I, a few. I, I had to say yes he had a few yeah. he had a few <laughs> but no it was it was it was interesting times um it was interesting for you as an exec because you could see our music, black music, was changing. Very much so, yeah. We just didn't have enough of it. Mm. Yeah. We had we had D'Angelo, who yeah. was a genius, but how hard was he to sell in the UK? He was a superstar, though. The yeah. charisma was yeah. there. Not that as much as charisma as so, Mark so, Morrison. So, so did <laughs> Mark Morrison you, you. and Babylon Zoo. Who signed, who signed Mark Morrison? One. Did you sign Mark Morrison? I did. Yeah, he, oh, did. Wow. he did. He signed Mark Morrison. Oh, Return of the mic. Mark Morrison. He, I, see, I remember being a kid and Mark then realising... I remember realising as a kid, like what a hit what a hit was because i went to turkey with my mum yeah and my family and i remember it was around the time that princess diana died i yeah. think it was and all they played was mark morrison all, that's all they played let me tell you like nothing else <laughs> this they did guy, not play nothing let me else. tell you if you're a star you wanted him to be your boss okay right he also signed this group <laughs> called babylon zoo yeah Okay. And Babylon Zoo. So I'm letting you know, right? I'm letting you know what you mean to me, yeah. Oh, just so you. you know, right? You. Because I remember some of your quotes. Just having a moment. So, ba yeah, I am a bit like you. Yeah, yeah, I am. With me. I am. So Babylon Zoo, <laughs> right, had a, the fastest-selling number one record in history called Spaceman, right? It was a was it a jeans it. advert as well. It was Levi's, yeah. Levi jeans advert. The fastest selling. It was ridiculous mm. oh. right and for once we were going to be downstairs in the courtyard celebrating champagne with the rest of the, the whole building right so clive goes on the monday he calls me in his office he goes so what's the guy's name from babylon zoo jazz man jazz man that's it so okay. clive goes so i called jazz man to say your number one man how do you feel man your number fastest selling number one ever he says forget that clive yeah i've seen myself on telly four times this this, this weekend <laughs> That it, Clive goes to me, that's what a star is. Mm. It's nothing to do with when we sold a, a million records in 10 seconds. It's yeah. like, I've seen myself. How much time have you seen time. yourself? Yeah. yeah. Loved a star. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You Love know, so it was, it was good times. Amazing. Do you know what? There's so much, like, there's so much things to How are we going to do this? There's three minutes left of the show. Is that all? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think what's more important is this edgy young A&R man that I did employ 4,000 years ago when most of you were in shorts. <laughs> <laughs> this morning was presenting Popmaster on Radio 2. Yeah. And I yeah, got yeah. 36 out of 39 right. So oh, wow. I, I think that, for Radar, I think that's, yeah. as you're allowed to say on Radar, fucking incredible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just honestly say... And it is weird, you know, Radio 2, none of you listen to. No one in here. Your they will do when they're older. Your parents might, your granny might, no. or something like that. No, but I've but listened bigger, to it one time. It's the you? biggest station in Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's massive. Full stop. So I get asked to do Ken Bruce's show, which is on After Chris Evans, which is the biggest breakfast show in more or less the world, well. more or less. Okay. And the only reason I said yes was because I feel really comfortable that, you know, it doesn't matter what they're playing that it doesn't dilute what I am. A hundred percent. Because when you get to that point, you know what I mean? You can the, soul's more, you, the show's more soulful, though. Yeah, this you, you can have a laugh. Yeah, 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 I changed it a little bit, yeah. and you can have a laugh, and look who's listening. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the yeah, sort yeah. Of, You just don't, you know, you never know, and you should never pigeonhole yourself. This is my last message. Mm. Yes, be known for something, and everyone says R&B, Trevor Nelson, whatever, Yeah. but doesn't mean you've got to pigeonhole yourself this is just the beginning for yeah. everyone in here you know you, right. you there's nothing you can't do yeah there's not he used to always believe in me i never believed in myself he's yeah. called me sydney potter you're gonna be a star yeah yeah, yeah. sydney <laughs> my dad wrote to serve with love as well <laughs> he wrote to serve. <laughs> so you i mean you've got yeah. you've won numerous awards they don't mean nothing you've they yeah. don't mean nothing not seriously e not even, you don't a, sony, home. You not don't, even a sony the goal? sony goal was the biggest award yeah for me yeah the others honestly i mean this um, the only thing that means anything to me is putting on a good gig, listeners liking my show. Yeah. The awards, you don't go home and feel, it's nice to win, mm. but you don't go home and, you know, if it's a team thing and mm. you've got loads of people celebrating with you, when it's an individual thing, sometimes it makes you even more lonely because yeah. you become hated, you know? And, and people, I, I think the Sony one was the one I liked. There's the only one yeah. I've got that I went home and I went, damn, my peers. You know, they've given me the Lifetime Achievement Award and I'm not even dead. Yeah. You know, that was really nice. And you, f you feel like you still have legs in this game still. Oh, I mean, I'm, you're still I, up and down the bro, country. I'm, even, I'm I started. You're still <laughs> up and down. I mean, I, mean it's, I think uh, it's important to know this because I think a lot of people may not know 
but you are still literally up and down the country putting on yeah. you know soul nation events at very big venues still yeah yeah at very big yeah, venues I still listen it's i don't do too much yeah but i just do enough can you you have to ask him that question you know what? Isn't there another DJ trying to sorry, come on? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You no, know we just got show. Yeah, so we're I think right. it's, I think it's right. important to ask this question okay. before. You know what? And it's kind of, it, it, I'm asking this a little out of context in the scope of this interview, but it was, I sat down with Angel two mm. days ago. Oh, Brandon, Angel, just, yeah. just, just, I was just sitting talented down with like, it. Very dude. talented, very talented. And I hadn't seen him for a minute. And yeah. I sat down, we were talking, we were talking. And, it, and then I knew this, this was coming up. Mm. And I am a, promoter all day long of black mm. music that's all i've ever signed yeah that's all i want to win mm-hmm. and i was sitting and i was thinking after my conversation with angel because he's so fucking talented mm. right but i was like why is black british r&b like why is it so hard, so hard. why is it so, so difficult hard. compared to uh, other british black music know. a male the hardest thing to break in this country as far as i'm concerned is a male black vocalist i've seen so I've had them in a live lounge. Mm. I've had so many from clubs mm. to whoever to mm. just one after the other, mm. and I don't get it. I, the only one we've had in recent times is Lamar, and he went through mm-hmm. Fame Academy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can't think of anyone else who sold like, an album. Tundi from Lighthouse Family, you know, Mark yeah. a hit. You know, it, it, I don't know why. I don't yeah. know why, and I think it's going <clears> to <throat> happen. But I, I don't want. I don't. I never play the race card. Mm. That's one thing about me. Mm-hmm. I don't play the race card because I think. We know where we are. We're mm. in a unique country. It's a mm-hmm. beautiful country when you think about it. You look at what's the shit happening in America right now. Yeah, That's course. why I love being British. Of yeah. course. Because it's, it, it, people moan over here. Don't be silly. Mm. Mm. That place is crazy. The only, the only colour they like is green over mm-hmm. there. Yeah. Right? yeah. But here, it's, it's, it's different. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, but it's different here. Mm. It's yeah. different here. You know, you can be... So many female singers from this country have been magnificent recently mm. and done quite well. Mm. And there seems to be a good platform for them. I don't know about the black male, Clive. Clive, I was going to ask you as well. Clive, Bill- I don't get Billy it. Billy Ocean is the only one. <laughs> come on! <laughs> that's a Billy Ocean. That, Billy. That, that, mm. that's and I tell you, the, 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 you the secret is A and R is the problem. When you sign acts, you sign them because they're on a roll. When you sign Angel, it's because he's hot. Mm. And so you, you nod along and you pray he turns into the best songwriter that mm. Holland Dozier Holland were. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The difference, if you look at Terence Trent Derby, who unfortunately did have an American accent and was born in Germany, but Terence. Mark Morris and Billy Ocean were very heavily A and R'd. Mm. No one high fived them and told them it's they true. were a genius. They told them, if you want to make great records, here's the Holland Dozier Holland catalog, here's the Diane Warren songs. Mm. You've got to really fucking work if you're going to be Marvin it's Gaye. Yeah. In this country, and everyone here goes, it's sick, it's sick, high five, it's sick, and yeah. praise that they write better <laughs> songs than anyone. No one does the creator. In America, they do. In America, in black music, any music, most executives are 60 to 70 to 80 years old. They've got pedigree. They know the standard rules, which are good works. songs, well sung. It's not about rhythms. It's not about BPMs. It's about good songs, but there's well one, there's sung. There's one exception to that rule, Craig David, which I didn't say. Great oh, yeah. songwriter. Craig David, mm-hmm. if you listen to that album, mm-hmm. unbelievable Born songs. to do IT. Unbelievable yeah. songs. And why did, it, why did he fall off a little bit? A lot. Artful the Dodger. Songs. Artful Dodgers. The songs the production, went wrong. The songs mm-hmm. and everything. Mm-hmm. And... You know, I think this is another problem. Um, we had it with Miss Dynamite a little bit. Mm. First album, you know, was def- definitely good. I'd love to have been there, A&R, man. No yeah. disrespect to Gavin, who did it. Yeah. But the second, you know, di- both Craig and Miss Dynamite came to my office, phoned me up. When I wasn't in the, rec- in, mm. in, 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 the, in the industry, they phoned me up personally and said, can I play you my new album? And I was like, I haven't said this before ever publicly, right? And I was like, I didn't really want to hear it because I'm not the A&R man mm. I'm the guy who's got to play their stuff on national radio and I didn't want to give an opinion Yeah. and I sat and listened to both their follow up albums and I was really disappointed Yeah. and I felt it was down to A&R mm. I, mm-hmm. like Clive said I think you know Terence Trent Derby just before we get out of here it's going way back mm. an amazing debut album just one of the greatest debut yeah, albums yeah. and I think Lincoln and maybe Muff Mitch, Winwood, Muff, Muff Winwood yeah. was A&R then mm-hmm. all of a sudden he got too big for his boots he said yeah. I can do this I can do this I can do my own second album completely mm. fell off the charts yeah. never to be heard of again mm. yeah and sad thing so it's it is down to A&R it, it, like we looked after yeah. Lyndon yeah. and then I left the label yeah you know, after the first album and it is you, you, I, the only thing that I was that's tearing me apart was leaving Lyndon yeah because he needed me 
Yeah. You know, you really needed me, and you do need to be a team. I not, think not also as Babylon Zoo needed me. <laughs> yeah, I think there's also there's also conversations yeah. to be talked about in how people digest music these days as well. But I mean, Trev, you it's know been what, brilliant. bro? It's been great talking listen, to you. Listen, man, we could sit and really? they're throwing gang signs at me yeah. right now. Like, listen, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> yeah. sorry, we're so sorry. We're taking but your Trev, show. Up. Trev, it was an honor. Thank you. It was an honor. I've no, known you for pleasure. a long time. Yeah. Um, a dear friend introduced us, and I'm glad that I've been able to do your it's parties good, and meet you and being able to follow some of your blueprint in in, in in my in my Just, journey as um, well, listen I, I and come, you have not changed I, one i know piece. but i come here i've got to be honest with you i think all this is brilliant mm. i think radar i think all this sort of thing what's going on here and you know i lived around the corner on banner street for 10 years yeah and then you know and my daughter doesn't even like saying she's my daughter mm. <laughs> it's like she's ashamed of me or something but yeah. she does her own thing i don't prop her up and I just love the enterprise. I love it. Yeah, I man. think it's a great. I think I hope you guys do really well. Thank you. And it's such a professional setup in there. I am very jealous. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we never had this. It's, uh, <laughs> so Chucky and Benny, thanks for having me. Yeah, Thank you, Trevor. Thank you. Love, love, Thank you. Yes, Radar Radio. Uh, welcome to the neighbourhood. Myself, Chucky Online, Benny Scars. Are we back in two we're weeks? We're back or? in two weeks. I know we've been away. We've got another run of shows. So we're back in two weeks. We'll see you then. All right, cool. Yeah, shout out to Hanif, by the way. Big up, Hanif. <laughs>